Hello, my name is CJ and this is Music Monday. So today we're going to be talking about ancient music, ancient historical music. This covers a period that is roughly somewhere between 2000 and 2500 years. That's a lot of time. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to go over every aspect. We don't even have a time to make broad brush strokes of everything. So because the period of 2,500 to 2,000 years is so dense, um, that's such a huge amount of time, and there's so much that happens in that period of time, uh, so much development of human culture and human civilization, that we're going to really narrow down the field of what we talk about in terms of historical music today um, to a very, 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 very small subset. Um, and the reason for that is just, I've got 30 minutes to entertain you and <laughs> 2,500 years of history. Dude, we could talk about that for years. We're going to talk um, specifically about two aspects of um, ancient um, historical music. Um, and we're going to do it through roughly four lenses. The first lens we're going to use is the Greek lens or the Greco-Roman lens. Um, and the reason we're choosing these is because they kind of feed into each other. They influence each other. And so we're talking about some broader concepts about ancient music, uh, but within the lens of Western history. And this is really important to understand. Western history is very different um, in terms of musical development, um, also in terms of political and social and cultural development um, from non-Western history. So I want to make it very clear. We're talking specifically about Western music, um, mostly because that's what I'm most familiar with. In the future, I may do other cultures, um, but since I'm not as familiar with them, uh, that's a lot more work for me, uh, and I want to make sure I do it justice. So we're going to stick with Western history, and we're going to talk about Western music through four lenses today. Uh, we're going to talk about it through Greek, Roman, ancient Hebrew, and ancient Christian lenses. And the reason we've ch I've chosen those four lenses to look through is that, um, first of all, they span almost the entire period um, from the beginning of written history all the way through uh, 4 500 CE. Uh, so those four cultures will span that distance. The second reason is that those four cultures flow together very quickly. So these really influence each other and they flow into each other and, and there's a lot of melding and borrowing and mixing um, all the way through to about 500 CE. And so that's really important. So we're just talking about a little bit of flow here. So we're going to start with Greek music. Music in ancient Greece was a part of almost everything they did. Um, every aspect of life was influenced in some way by music. Um, boys started learning music as young as the age of six. It was part of the educational structure. It was one of two divisions that um, the Greeks had for their education, for educating their children. Uh, so it was essential in their uh, way of life, in their um, life's philosophy. Um, a lot of the um, mathematicians and philosophers of ancient Greece talked extensively about music. Um, they created structures for music that are actually quite different than our structures today. Um, and they were pretty adamant that those were the correct structures for producing music. So um, as far as the technical side, we're going to um, focus mainly on Greece. We're going to talk a little bit about their instruments, about the musical structure and how they saw music. Then we're going to shift and we're going to talk about ancient Jewish music or ancient Hebraic music. Um, and the reason we're going to shift back in time a little bit is that I wanted to cover the technical side first. So ancient Hebraic music actually feeds into ancient Christian music. And the reason it does that is because, well, Christianity came out of 
the Jewish faith. Um, the first Christians were Jews. So, you know, that works out well. Um, and a lot of what you see in particularly in ancient Hebraic music and ancient Hebraic uh, poetry in particular and religious poetry at that um, is a huge portion of early Christian um, music uh, or what they call early Christian hymnody. Um, so we'll be talking about that next. So to start with, let's talk about Greek and Roman music. So in Greece, um, like I said, uh, music was part of everything they did. Um, it was part of prayers. It was part of celebrations. It was part of theater. It was part of um, entertainment in the street. Music was everywhere and it was highly, highly valued as a part of a really well-rounded education, more or less. You were well-rounded if you could play music, if you understood how music worked. Now, interestingly, um, Greek musical structure was different, considerably so, than modern Western musical structure. We think in terms of keys and chords, which I talked about uh, a few weeks ago, if, um, if you're interested, I'll link that, you can find that link down below. Uh, see me talking about uh, the keys and chord structure of Western music now. In Greek music, they use what are called modes, which uh, is similar to a key, but subtly different. One of the biggest differences is how they arrange their scales. In modern uh, Western music, we arrange scales in sets of whole steps and half steps. So for example, in the key of C, we have whole steps from C to D and from D to E. However, we also have half steps, which is C to C sharp, C sharp to D, D to D sharp, and D sharp to E. What is pertinent about this, however, is that in Greek music, they didn't just do whole steps and half steps. They used quarter steps, which would be between those two tones. There would be a, a tone about halfway between them. And sometimes they even used eighth steps, which would be, there would be two additional tones between those two notes. So there was a much broader range of possible notes that could be played within a scale, within, uh, within, a, key, within a mode. Um, and so you have this really fascinating opportunity to try a lot of different things. Um, clearly on a keyboard, um, either an electric keyboard like this one or an acoustic keyboard, acoustic piano, um, it's very difficult to find these. However, you can tune a guitar. Uh, you can tune a guitar because of how um, how a guitar gets tuned. You can pretty easily tune a guitar to reflect these modes. Uh, so that's a that's a pretty cool thing, um, which I actually just learned about recently and have decided that I'm going to have to try. So in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, um, because ancient Rome adopted a lot of ancient Greece's um, culture, um, as they did with a lot of the other uh, countries, a lot of the other cultures that they uh, conquered, um, the Romans took a lot of the same, a lot of the things that the Greeks came up with and just kind of went, okay, these are ours now. Um, so when I talk about Greek culture, generally you can assume that the Romans took at least part of it. It's just a thing. So starting with ancient Greek philosophy about music, we see that the origin of music comes from the gods, uh, which is actually not uncommon in terms of um, how people explain how humans gained music. Um, this idea that it was a gift from the gods is, is 
prevalent in almost all societies. So the ancient Greeks, like many cultures, believed that music came to them from the gods. Um, they believed that Hermes gave music to Amphion, who was the first musician. Um, he eventually got a lyre, which he was able to play on. Um, and music becomes a huge um, integral part of their culture because of this. In terms of how this has influenced modern thought about music, we actually, the word we use, music, comes out of the Greek word muse. Uh, the muses were uh, goddesses, demigoddesses of um, inspiration. And we took their name and made a whole thing out of it. So music is the purview of the muses. Uh, music was very prevalent in everything from uh, public ceremony to private worship. Um, it built, um, it built community. It was all of those things that we talked about in prehistoric music, um, really developed in Greek society and it became more and more important. Let's talk a little bit about Greek instruments. So last week when we talked about prehistory, um, we talked about the three different types of instruments in prehistory. You have stringed instruments, you have wind instruments, and you have percussion instruments. The same is true in um, actually kind of throughout history. So there were a couple of different stringed instruments that the Greeks used. The first one is probably the most well known. It's called the lyre. Um, it's a precursor to the harp. Um, it was strung with a minimum of seven strings, sometimes more, usually more. Um, and it was on a tortoise shell um, frame. And the uh it was basically a, a handheld zither um a zither is played um sitting on something and you pluck it from the top um whereas a lyre is played um holding you know you hold it in your your arm and you pluck it this way so um similar structure a uh, very different sound, and it's clearly a smaller instrument than what you would normally see a zither be. So let's talk about stringed instruments. So the first uh, two stringed instruments that we're going to talk about are the lyre and the barbitos. And the lyre is basically just a smaller version of the barbitos, so the barbitos is just a larger version of the lyre. Um, basically, they were uh, precursors of harps or types of harps. Um, a lyre would be strung with seven strings, um, sometimes more. Um, the strings would be plucked, not strummed. Um, and they could be tuned depending on how tight you strung the strings. Um, interestingly, the lyre was really uh, an aristocratic instrument and it was often associated with the cult of Apollo, um, whereas the barbatos was more often associated with satyrs. Um, so less aristocratic and a bit more wild. The second instrument we're going to talk about is the kithara. Um, this is actually one of the possible um, candidates for a precursor to a guitar. In fact, even the sound of it sounds a lot like the word guitar. Kithara, guitar, there's some similarities there. Um, like the guitar, it had tuning uh, pegs at the top and uh, the strings were attached to a sound box at the bottom. Um, it was a much, much larger instrument than a lyre uh, and it was often played with a pick, more or less called a plectrum. Um, so very different from the lyre, still a plucked instrument, still a stringed instrument, um, but a very different setup, just like the guitar is very different from the harp. So this takes us to the wind instruments. Now the wind instruments, um, are mostly flutes, um, of some kind. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is called the aulos and the aulos is a V-shaped instrument, um, where you would blow into the top. And one side, one pipe would play a single note and then the other side would play multiple notes. So you would, you would cover, 
the holes and move your fingers to create different tones coming out of the second side. So you can make more than one sound come out of this pipe because you had more than one pipe. Um, similar to that, but subtly different, were the pan pipes. Um, unlike the aulos, which had holes that you would cover to create different sounds, um, the pan pipe actually functioned a lot like how we play, like if you blow across the top of a beer bottle or a pop bottle, you go, um, the air going across the top creates a sound. What makes it different is a similar technique to what happens when you cover different holes. The more holes you cover in an aulos, um, the further the air has to travel, which means that the uh, sound that comes out the bottom is much lower the more holes you cover. The further the air has to, has to go, the, um, the lower the sound. The same is true for pan pipes. But unlike the aulos where they used holes to create that technique, a pan pipe was a collection of reeds that were cut to different lengths. So the longer the length of reed, the deeper the sound, the shorter the length of reed, the higher the sound. Um, the uh, reeds were often bound together um, and then you would blow across the top of them. Again, just like you would a pop bottle, just blow across the top and it creates sound. The next one instrument we're gonna talk about is the salpinx. And the salpinx was almost exclusively a uh, military instrument. Um, it looked like a, a G, um, or like a really, really skinny sousaphone. Um, so you would have a, a mouthpiece that was usually made of bone and you would blow into the mouthpiece and then the rest of the instrument would go up and over. So behind you and over, and then you would have the bell up here. So if you've ever seen a marching fan, a marching band, um, you would probably think of them as tubas, but they're called sousaphones and they go around the person they blow into it and then the big bell comes out the top. This is a very similar structure. Um, however, a sousaphone has valves, um, which means you can create a lot of different sounds depending on um, lip position, what's called embouchure, um, and which valves you're pushing down. A salpinx doesn't have valves. So everything is controlled by the embouchure of the mouth how tight the lips are, how hard you're blowing, um, what position your lips are in. Um, and so it was mainly used for bugle calls, which is why it was predominantly used in the military. Now we come to my favorite, favorite wind instruments. So now we're gonna talk about my favorite ancient Greek instrument. It is called a hydraulis. Now, as the name suggests, hydraulics are involved. Um, a, an air pump or an air chest was, impl um, was involved to force water um, up into pipes and so that it would compress the air and create different sounds. Interestingly enough, this is a precursor of the organ. It had a keyboard, although probably not looking a lot like this. Um, it is a very different type of instrument. Um, in terms of uh, how it looked. Uh, but it is the, it's the, the earliest keyboard, uh, which is really cool to me. Um, this actually, while we don't have any, um, at least I couldn't find any evidence of any that had been preserved, there is a model of one that was found in the 1800s in Carthage. It was made of pottery. Um, and descriptions are uh, preserved in a couple of different places. And I'll put links to those down below so you can um, look into that a little further if you want to. So this brings us to percussion. And ancient percussion instruments, um, like prehistoric percussion instruments, were all about what kind of um, sounds could you make when you hit things. Um, there are three percussion instruments we're gonna talk about. Um, the first one is the tambourine, or um, also called the tympanum. Uh, basically, it's a tambourine. It's a piece of leather that's stretched across a frame. Um, it might have been decorated, uh, but it was mostly beaten with the palm of the hand. It was usually circular, and it was beaten with the palm of the hand to create rhythm. 
The second uh, instrument was a crotala, and crotalas were very uh, similar to what we now call castanets, which uh, are clicky instruments. They click together, they make a, a higher sound, um, and were often used in group dance. The last percussion instrument we're going to talk about is the kidunia. Um, now, the kidunia was um, basically like bells that were hit. Uh, hit or um, what we think of as cowbells. Uh, nowadays, we think of, you know, hitting the cowbell. Um, for those of you who enjoy the Saturday Night Live sketch um, <laughs> about needing more cowbell, um, know that that fever has been raging for quite some time. Um, even the ancient Greeks felt it. Um, but the Kedonia would be... Um, it's very similar to the concept of a xylophone, um, but instead of having, you know, blocks that were different shapes or different sizes, you would have bells of different size and you could play them um, and get a different tone depending on the size of the bell, the shape of the bell. So that gives you kind of an idea of ancient Greek music. So now we're going to move on to ancient Hebraic music or ancient biblical music. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about uh, is the use of music in religious uh, ceremonies or religious services. Uh, this is actually prevalent throughout uh, human history. Uh, as we talked about in prehistory, the religious context of music is absolutely found in almost every culture out there. Um, so the use of music in liturgy, in worship celebrations, um, is so very essential to the history of music. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on um, as we talk about ancient Hebraic music and then into the Roman and early Christian period. So in the Hebrew scriptures, starting with the Hebrew scriptures, um, in the uh, Pentateuch or in the Torah, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Bible is the first five books of the Old Testament. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, talk about music, mostly in terms of how it's used in celebration. Um, the earliest reference to music is found in Genesis. Um, and it happens in a conversation between two characters, between Laban, who is the um, uncle of Jacob, who is the grandson of Abraham. If that's not confusing, I don't know what is. But Jacob has married Laban's two daughters, and he has become very wealthy. Um, and if you're interested in more of the story, I'll put a link below to the story so you can read it. Um, lots of links today. Uh, but Laban goes off for a little bit and Jacob decides he's ready to go uh, for a variety of reasons, but he decides he's going to go and he's going to leave while his father-in-law is off doing stuff. So he packs up his wives and his children, all of his flocks and herds, and he heads off. Laban comes back, finds him gone, and also discovers that one of his daughters has stolen the household idols. Um, so he goes after him. And when they finally meet up, Laban says to Jacob, why did you sneak out? If I had known you were going to leave, I would have sent you off with the sound of singing and tambourines and harps. And this idea that you would send people off, you would say goodbye with music um, is a really interesting commentary on how important music was in the culture. Um, and particularly in momentous occasions in life. Uh, we might not think so much about leaving the in-laws as being a momentous occasion, but in the ancient world, travel was incredibly dangerous. Um, even several hundred miles could take you a week to travel, maybe more. Um, most people would travel by foot, maybe riding on some kind of pack animal, but it's not going to be a quick journey. And so the likelihood that Jacob and his family would ever come back to see Laban again before Laban died is very limited. The likelihood is very, very low. 
Um, and so the fact that Laban wants to, you know, says he wants to send off his daughters, his grandchildren and his son-in-law with music, this is an indication that it was a big deal. So um, that's the first time you really see music mentioned um, in the Torah, in the, the first five books. Um, in other Jewish writings, uh, particularly in the Kitsuvin, which is the writings, it's a part of Jewish scripture, um, in the Christian Bible, it includes um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, um, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, the Song of Songs, the Book of Job, Esther, but the ones that I want to talk about today are Psalms, the Song of Solomon, Lamentations, and then I want to talk a little bit about the book of Job. So um, I want to particularly talk about Psalms. So the reason I want to talk about Psalms is that it is basically a hymnody. It is a collection of religious songs. Um, a lot of them are attributed to King David, who ruled over Israel and was considered um, more or less the golden age of Israel. He conquered uh, the furthest extent of uh, the Israel uh, borders. Uh, he expanded the kingdom. Um, and he was, he was a really charismatic figure. He was a musician himself. He'd been a shepherd as a boy. Uh, he was the youngest of, I think, seven kids of seven sons. Um, so he could have had sisters. Uh, but he was the youngest of seven sons. And uh, one of the most interesting things is as a shepherd, while there is a lot to do, sometimes you're just watching the sheep graze. And so as a shepherd, you might have a significant amount of time to compose music. And clearly, David was capable of doing that. One of the interesting things about David um, and the way he writes music is that you see a wide variety of emotions expressed in that music, um, particularly in the Psalms. You see everything from um, Psalms of lament, Psalms of great fear. Uh, how long, O oh Lord, will you turn your face from me? How long will you forget me? Um, to great joy and gladness. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Um, and so you see this wide range of emotions um, within the Psalms that are written. Um, so that's the Psalms. The next one is the Song of Songs. Now, um, if you're not familiar with the Song of Songs, it's also called the Song of Solomon. Often it's credited to Solomon. Um, there's some question about that. We're not going to go into authorship um, today. But the Song of Songs is interesting in that it is a love song. Um, it has some narration at the beginning, but the song is really, um, a, it's a love song about two people meeting and falling in love and courting and getting married. And so it's this description of the process of falling in love. Um, it is very explicit in how it describes the human body. Uh, the words, the, the author took great joy um, and pleasure in describing how beautiful uh, their lover is. And so it's this really fascinating use of music in a religious text. I highly recommend it. Again, I will link it down below, link a, link a uh, translation of it down below. Um, give it a read. It's, it's really very fascinating. Um, then we come to the other, we're going to swing to the other side of the emotional scale and we're going to look at, at Lamentation. So Lamentations is uh, a collection of laments and laments are songs of mourning, um, songs of sorrow, songs of pain and anguish. And when you read through Lamentation, um, you get a real sense of loss within the context. Now, Lamentation was written um, after the destruction of Israel and the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. Um, so it has a lot of uh, the context of the, the songs in Lamentation are all about losing 
um, losing your homeland, losing your identity. Uh, one of the things that happened in the ancient world, Babylon was particularly good at this, um, was that when they conquered a people, if the people gave them problems, they would remove them from their homeland and resettle them in a variety of places. And one of the things that that did was it destroyed the sense of identity as what they had been, their nationality. So if you were an Israelite or you were a Hittite or you were an Amorite um, or you were a Canaanite, if you were removed from your people, even if you were with your same family, you move to a new place, new neighbors, people who don't share the same identity as you. After a few generations, that identity is lost. And lamentation really um, goes into that and, and, and talks about the deeply painful process of mourning the loss of that identity. Now, we're going to move on to the book of Job. Um, and the book of Job is again, very different in how it's, uh, how it's laid out. It is in large part a narrative, um, but it's really put together almost like a performance piece, a parable that might be performed. And so you would have a narrator who would talk, but then there are monologues and dialogues within the story um, that would probably have been sung and because it's a parable, it teaches a lesson, um, uh, particularly on wisdom. Because it's very focused on, on the message that it's conveying, um, everything is shown through that lens of the parable. And so you get this really cool um, performance piece, basically, uh, that is talking about uh, the story of this guy named Job. Um, I will link, again, I will link a translation down below if you're interested in reading more about Job. Um, I highly recommend you do. These are fascinating pieces of uh, music, although you don't have music necessarily. The original music isn't included, clearly. Um, but it gives you a sense of what it might have sounded like, uh, at least in a translation into English. Um, so that's ancient Hebraic music. Now we move closer, as we move closer to um, the divide between before the common era and the common era, um, we see a lot of cultural changes. When you get into the first century BCE, um, Greece, Judea, which is ancient Israel, um, basically the whole known world is conquered by the Romans. Uh, and one of the great strengths of the Romans, they had some pretty nasty habits, but one of the great strengths of their empire was that they had a tendency, as long as you didn't kick up too big of a fuss, to allow the culture um, that was there before to continue. Um, if it didn't interfere with what they wanted to do with their empire, you could continue to do it. Um, so Greece is highly admired. The Grecian culture was highly admired by the Romans. Um, and so they adopted a lot of the Greek, um, the, the Greek gods were more or less transferred over, um, given new names, but basically you have the same pantheon. Um, a lot of the same traditions and, um, musical styles. The musical instruments are very similar. Uh, they have slightly different names, uh, but the form of the instruments doesn't change very much. Uh, really, the difference in the names is going from Greek, the Greek language, into the Latin language. Um, so that's really uh, an interesting adaptation. You have this uh, appropriation of Greek culture and it becomes Roman culture. Um, so we get into the first century CE and we're approaching the end of the ancient world. Um, and some really interesting things happen. Clearly, um, the first clash of cultures is that, uh, the Romans basically conquer the entire known world and they start to take from all these cultures, 
bits and pieces that they like. Now the cultures, as long as their cultural aspects are, they don't interfere with Roman interests, you're allowed to keep those cultural aspects. But if they interfere with Roman interests, you got a problem. And uh, Rome was pretty adamant about stamping out things that they didn't like. Um, so when we get to the first century, Rome has more or less become an empire and they're expanding. And one of the places that they expand over is the, what's, what was called Palestine, um, at the time, um, it's now mostly Israel. Um, and Palestine, Judea was a, um, particularly Judea was a pretty, um, pretty interesting place. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of the political um, and social struggles that were going on. Um, but Judea in particular is a hotbed of revolutionary activity. Moving into the first century CE, you have zealots or um, rebels um, who consistently uh, attempt to overthrow Roman rule. And into this hotbed of political and cultural upheaval comes this upstart religion. Uh, it grows out of the Jewish faith um, and they call themselves Christians or Christ followers. Um, and they have a lot of Jewish traits. Um, they come out of the Jewish religious tradition, um, holding a lot of the same um, cultural expectations, but there are some differences. Um, one of the big ones is that they center their religious beliefs around a guy who is crucified, executed by the Romans, um, <clears throat> which is a whole nother story. Uh, but in developing this new religion, um, new music comes to the fore. Some of the ancient uh, Jewish music comes into the, the Christian uh, sect, the Christian um, development, but a lot of the traditions of music um, are adapted, particularly vocal music is adapted from the ancient Hebraic tradition. And as Christianity becomes uh, wider and wider spread um, over the next 300 years, the development of music um, changes as well. They're influenced by Roman culture because um, they're no longer exclusively Jewish. Uh, a lot of the people who are accepting this new faith are not Jewish. And so they bring their own concepts of music, their own ideas of music into what essentially becomes what's called a hymnody, which is a collection of religious music. So interestingly enough, um, some of the earliest records that we have concerning ancient Christian music are found in non-Christian sources, particularly in some letters written by Pliny the Younger. Um, when he writes to um, Tro uh, the Emperor Trajan, but Pliny asks for advice on how to deal with these people. And he's describing um, their modus of operation, um, their mode of operation and how they rise together early and sing a hymn, uh, sing hymns to God or sing hymns to Christ as to a God, um, and they sing them antiphonally. And antiphonally means it's um, alternating um, people singing in alternating groups. Um, and they would, it's almost, it's not a call and response, it's more like a response and response, um, or an echo, or um, what's sometimes called singing in the round, it's very similar. Um, and so this, this type of singing um, is actually pretty common in ancient in the ancient world. Um, and so this this idea that this was a, a way that ancient Christians uh, worshiped um, gives us some evidence of how they did. By the time you get to the 400s and 500s, accompaniment by um, instruments was frowned on. 
um, it was considered uh, non-Christian or uh, profane to use instrumental accompaniment, which is interesting. It's um, as we talk a little bit more about religious music, you'll see that this idea of to accompany or not to accompany, um, the pendulum swings back and forth. And so it's a it's an interesting um, interesting development, an interesting argument um, that goes back and forth over you know the two millennia. Um, so that takes us up to 500 CE. Yay! We've gotten through ancient history. One of the things I think we need to remember when we're looking at the history of music is that, first of all, music is universal. It occurs everywhere. We create it in every culture. How we structure it, how we learn it, how we pass it on, that changes. Um, although not terribly substantially because the basics of music remain the same. So you might have a different name for something, but it's going to have very similar connotations culture to culture. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe below, um, hit the little bell to get notifications. Otherwise, I'll see you next Monday. Bye.